The key to stock picking, whether it's in resources or any industry, is doing your own work, forming your own conviction. And if this thing 10X is in, and you only sold 10%, I mean, you, you've done well. People forget that if you double your money every three years and you did that for 20 years, you would probably be in the top one or two or three investors in the world. As my capital grew, you know, it might have went to four to five, then five to six, and six to seven. And today I manage a fund and we have eight. You know, so we're very concentrated still. Averaging down can be the biggest curse that investor does, but it can be also be the biggest asset. When you search Twitter or X or wherever and there's no activity, yeah. there's no, no one talking about it. There's no cult type behavior in it. Yeah, that's what I, I, I love that part of it. Like when you feel like, all right, this is a brand new almost idea. Risk for, risk for me mainly revolves around the dilution part. Well, I, I would say that I'm usually like 95% invested. Okay. So, you know, I have like enough cash there where I can buy something, but not enough of something. It, it forces me to make the second decision of what do I need to sell? All right, Ian, you're uh, back on again after not, not too long, actually, about a month or two so ago. Uh, but this time I want to talk to you for selfish reasons, basically, specifically because I, I, I finally have a winner. So I suppose it's a, it's a good reason. Apparently stocks don't only go down. And uh, one of mine has actually gone up quite a lot, actually, from, from, Somewhat of an average, I think the average cost of, would have been like 13 or so cents went to about a dollar. It's now sort of settling at around 80 cents. Um, I haven't sold anything, so it's really only a paper win yet, but it does feel like a win. Still, I'm confused. I don't really know how to approach it anymore because I've made mistakes in my approach in the past when I had winners. Yeah, kind of confused, and I want to talk to you about all this. So what do I do? What do I what do I do here? <laughs> <laughs> it's a very open-ended question and yeah, it's, uh, sure. it's great to be on the program again and, and talk to you and your audience but um you know sell, selling winners it's it's difficult you know you normally sell a stock at least what i believe you usually sell a stock for kind of four different reasons you know the the first couple are kind of bad reasons you know the first reason is um you know the story changes you know the the company's evolved in a bad way and you just need to exit it you know number two you know the the at least for me, you know, I find that all of a sudden management is incompetent um, or untrustworthy. You know, that's usually when I sell immediately. You know, number three, and this is probably happens the most for a lot of investors, is you find something better than that idea. Um, and you have something to replace it with on a kind of risk adjusted IRR. You find something better than what you already own or your eighth best idea or whatever it is. And number four, you know, you sell something because it becomes overvalued. Um, the stock gets ahead of where it should be. And we would all love to sell for that reason, because that means you made a lot of money too fast. Um, and that falls under the best bucket to be in. And it sounds like that's maybe the the framing of what the scenario you're in is that last one is a stock that went up four or five X and you're staring at it. Um, you're staring at a big game too, and just wondering you know what to do. And so probably the, probably the questions I would ask you would be, you know, are it, did the stock go up based on fundamental reasons? Mm. For you know, sure. Is, is, how do you think about the valuation of the company now versus you know where you think it should be? If you were looking at the company now at 80 cents for the very first time, would you buy it here? Mm. Yeah. And so just think about kind of those three questions uh, to get you back to where you need to be. And it's hard to, it's, sometimes it's hard to answer those questions and not be biased. Uh, because you're still looking at a big gain, you know, and it's hard to to kind of take a step back and look at something new as if it was an investment for the first time. Would I genuinely buy it here? Um, for me, you know, and we're a little, maybe a little bit different with our investment philosophies, which we'll probably get into a little bit when we talk about active patients. But, you know, I think um, for me, when I've sold because something has gone up too far too fast, it kind of looks like it's a business that was trading at 10 times earnings and in a year it traded to 100 times earnings, you know, 10x in a year, uh, just got way overvalued from a valuation earnings per share basis. And, you know, it was just what I found is when a company does make that type of move, that 98% of the time, they will eventually stub their toe in a quarter. And all of a sudden that thing that's priced for perfection gets cut in half. And then it, you know, trades and churns for a period of quarters or years as those fundamentals kind of backfill into that stock price. And it just takes time to kind of get back up to that new high. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I've had to sell 
things like that many times that just got overvalued because I felt like I was kind of pulling forward five years worth of returns into the present. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just, it's just kind of common sense. It takes them off the table as well. So mm -hmm. I don't know if that's helpful. It might be even more challenging because in my case, it's a non-revenue generating company that we are talking yeah. about here. I don't, I don't, I don't want to say too much because I know people who who follow along or watch sort of a big YouTube channel will uh, might sort of get a, a different idea. Um, but people who have followed along actually will know what I'm talking about. But I've again, I've never had any big wins in this space yet. There's still people right now glued to glued to the screen, to the phone, or whatever it is. Thinking like, what is it? What's the name of the stock? Give me just say the name so I can buy it and and stop watching this video and make a bunch of money. And and there will be those comments too. People always look sort of for stock tips, which is weird to me again, given that I haven't really had any success. But that aside, I think this is sort of a in that article of active patience that you sent me. The very good article, by the way. But it's I think this is one of those one or two great opportunities that happen every few years. That's how. It doesn't only feel like I've done extensive research into this company. I I, I think I understand the geology and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Talk to the management extensively for many hours, and so I think this is one of those two they, uh, one or two opportunities that you talk about in your in your blog post. And so I I suppose the question is how do I know how far I should let it run? Because I mean, if I sell now, I might feel obligated to maybe even reinvest the money in a mediocre opportunity uh, that I maybe I I over over convince myself on and then maybe lose money on it. And and again, being there, done that. So it, it's sort of what I'm thinking about is how do I know that enough is is enough? Because even if I like the rocks, that doesn't mean the stock cannot go down for the next two years uh, because of market mm -hmm. conditions or whatever else. Yeah. I said and a lot. I don't even have a question there. Well, no, I mean, I think it just comes back to where do you, the key to stock picking, whether it's in resources or any industry is doing your own work, forming your own conviction. And coming up with your own analysis of what the value of that business should be versus where it's trading, hmm. you know, and that, and that's kind of the opportunity in the stock market, the public stock market, because what I've found is, you know, the, you know, the old voting machine versus weighing machine, hmm. you know, quote that everybody likes to talk about, but you know, when it comes to small stocks, what I've found is, you know, whatever, whatever your stock you're in, you know, wherever it's trading is usually kind of the, where the majority of holders see the company based on a three month time frame. Most people are short term. Um, and so a lot of times with things, if you can form an independent viewpoint on where you think that business or situation can be in one to three years, um, you will be a step ahead of others in making money because most people, even though they talk about having a long term mindset, are looking at the next quarter. Um, or the, the next whatever it is 43 101. I don't know, you know, it, uh, the equivalent in, in resources. And so, you know, really the opportunity is to, to do that work, to form an independent mindset. And if you believe that that business or that situation that's up 500% in a few months, you know, is generally going to be worth a lot more in three years based on the work that you've done, you know, then perhaps you shouldn't sell it, you know, mm -hmm. and you also have to ask yourself if this thing pulls back 30, 40%, am I going to kick myself for not selling it here? Because it's probably a coin flip that that happens. You yeah. know, and so it, it there's a lot of things that weigh in that, whether it's, you know, I could have sold 20% of it to to pay off some of my mortgage, or I could have done this or that. Like it's all kind of you're looking at what it's not only just putting that money into other stocks, but other things, personal finance situation you're in, or whatever it, the case may be, that um you're also kind of comparing holding versus taking a little bit off versus all of it. Because you don't have to sell all of it. It's just a question of do you want to sell a little bit or a lot or any. That that's something worth talking about because in this case I'm not I'm not questioning the company almost at all. That that might be a dangerous position to be in. But th this re rate that happened in the stock was really a re rate. It didn't go up on a promote or anything like that. It went from a company that was headed for bankruptcy to being turned around to you know making something out of itself and and something that was that was very notable to the market to push it that much. Um, in my opinion, the market still does not understand the broad thesis. I think it's much bigger than what it is, yada, yada, yada. That doesn't that doesn't matter too much right now because we're not discussing this specific company. What I'm thinking about is the money that I have in it right now is material to me. So I could, um, like if I sold everything, which is obviously not something I'm willing to do, If even if I decide to sell some, I will probably not sell everything. But if I sold everything sort of in one go, 
I could pay off the rest of my mortgage, for example. And that's a very real sort of tangible thing, right? Where like I, I live in this apartment here. And that's sort of what messes with my brain because I like this opportunity and I want to keep the money in. But then at the same time, it's something that's very material to me. So that's more where I'm coming from. Would you would you re ever regret selling 10%? Well, I suppose it, I mean, if, if the temp, if the stock does another 10 X or whatever from here, sure. Uh, cause that's going to be a hundred percent in that case, that 10%, right? So, um, it, it, it's, it's going to be another mortgage on top of that. Right. So, yeah. So it's like, yeah. I mean, if, if you ask me right now, would you, would you, would you regret not being able to pay off your mortgage with, with that 10%? Yeah. And uh, it, like, if I can wait two years and then pay off the mortgage, not with 100% of the position, but with 10% of the position. Yeah, I mean, that changes things. And that's the thing that confuses yeah. me, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's, you're, you're looking at it through glass half full eyes, which is, which is normal. Um, and I'm not saying that's the wrong way to look at it. But you know, there's, nothing, there's nothing wrong with selling 10%, paying off some of your mortgage and seeing what it feels like. You know, it's like, it's, you're probably not going to regret paying off, you know, more of your personal finance debt you know, in the, in the long term, regardless. And if this thing 10 X is in and you only sold 10%, I mean, you, you've done well. Um, sure, yeah. So yeah, there's, there's a lot that go into it. A lot of it's personal decisions outside of just market situations and the positions themselves. But what's interesting about that position that you mentioned, which I picked up on was, you know, you, you said that you, you bought in at a price when it was basically priced for bankruptcy, you know, or, Many people were thought it was going out of business. And I think that's a good lesson, actually, uh, when you think about buying new positions, because whether you're in, especially in resources, what I found, and, and especially in micro cap as well, it's like when people people get into the space because they want to find a 10 bag or a 50 bag or a 100 bag or a thousand bag or whatever the course may, whatever the thing is, you know, but and so a lot of people are looking at this thing that could be this huge thing. Um but what I found over the years is a lot of times that huge thing presents itself as something that is at a valuation when you initially buy it, is at a valuation where you can't really lose that much money on it because it's already priced so low where not that much has to go right for you to make two, three, five X in your case. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a good lesson, even especially in resources, is your buy-in price is very important. You know, the price that you're paying for something when you initially take a position in something is very important. Mm. Um, and I don't think a, enough emphasis is put on that that part of it when you're initially taking a new position is the fact that, you know, you should be thinking about your downside. Um, you should be thinking about your downside a lot more than what most people most people do, you know? Yeah. Because a, a, lot, a lot of the big thing about winning big is just losing small. And... A lot of people forget that if you can just double your money every three years, that's a 25 to 26% CAGR. And that sounds really boring to a resource investor, to anybody, you know, that's kind of more on the story stock end of the spectrum, like doubling your money in three years. Like what? I want to 10 X my money in three years. What are you talking about? But people forget that if you double your money every three years and you did that for 20 years, you would probably be in the top one or two or three investors in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, you'd be the best investor in the world if you just double your money every three years. And so if you look at new investments through that lens, maybe you did with this one, maybe you didn't with this one that was priced basically as a zero. You know, it's kind of what that represented. Like not that much had to go right for you to double your money. Um, and I think that's the right mindset to be in when you're looking at new investments mm. is where can't, where, where won't I lose money? Yeah. Yeah. That's one way. There's something we can, you can also elaborate on. Later on, but now that I'm thinking about that, the company is not even trading. The company is trading as a scam at the time when I went in because it might have been this. Well, to our opinion, uh, the CEO was was mismanaging the company, and so two friends of mine basically brought the opportunity to me. I like to believe that I helped a little bit in restructuring the company, but the, the new CEO came in. Uh, they got a little bit of money. They got a little bit of air, paid back the debt, restarted the drilling, and on and on and on, and. Um, so it was basically priced as, yeah, again, a, a zero. And that's what makes me think that this is those one or two great opportunities that you come across every couple of years, not so often. And so another question is like, if uh, like am I actually going to pay off my mortgage, which is a 2.5% two, two mortgage? And 
I think 2.55% to be specific. Am I going to do that? Or am I going to have sort of itchy hands and, 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 and go and try and replicate what I just did, but maybe lose my money because I'm sort of excited from this win. That's also something yeah. that I'm, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, and we, we talked a little bit about this before we started rolling the interview, but you know, I, I was kind of in a similar situation when I was uh, in my twenties where, you know, I had a couple big wins. Um, I was staring at a mortgage and even though I'm probably perceived by most people as having a high risk tolerance, volatility tolerance, being a, basically a full-time micro cap investor, you know, that I take a lot of risk, which I don't believe I do. Um, but that's at least the perception, but I, I really handle my personal finances really, really conservatively because I was a private full-time investor for 10 years, not anymore because I manage a fund, but for 10 years, I just managed, lived, supported myself and my family off my portfolio and being in that circumstance and being the type of investor I am, which is concentrated in five or 10 ideas, having to go through market cycles, you know, you can have a year or two where you don't make any money or you lose money and then you can make three or 400% in a year. And you kind of make, you know, you kind of, uh, um, you make, you can make all the money in one out of every four years. And so that just means you have to live conservatively. And I've always been cautious with my personal finances and specifically debt, where I always wanted to pay off my mortgage as quickly as I could, because I always wanted to, to raise the floor of my worst case scenario, you know, because it was okay when I was single and a private investor supporting myself. But when you have a wife and then you have kids, you're like, okay, you know, I, I don't want to, if I, my account blows up for some odd reason, you know, I at least want to own where we live, you know, <laughs> and that for me was more of a comfort level. And even looking back at the money that I paid off that mortgage with, and yes, it would have been up multiples by now. I still think that was a very good decision, you know, mm -hmm. because it let me sleep at night. It let my wife sleep at night. It let just, you know, it gives you that just comfort and it gives you a, the emotional support that's also very necessary to be an investor as well. Just um, to have that in the back of your mind that, Hey, you know, my family's taken care of. Mm. It's that that's an interesting point. When you say that you're raising the um, sort of the, the worst case scenario at the bottom, if you will, you're sort of raising it for yourself. Um, aren't you lowering the ceiling simultaneously though? Like, isn't it, isn't it sort of an effect where you're just basically shrinking what you can do in life, if you will? It is, but it's all, it's all relative. I mean, you're going to make that money back anyway, you know, eventually, you know, if you're confident in yourself and your abilities. So I didn't really, you know, whether you're, whether it's, you know, 200,000 or 500,000 or whatever the, the mortgage is, it's just like, it's kind of viewed it as, you know, eventually I'll make that back, but it's just a peace of mind more than anything. Okay. Do you um, think that made you a better investor sort of knowing like, okay, my mortgage is paid off. Now I can afford to maybe take even bigger risks that are maybe perceived as, as risks, but they're not necessarily bigger risks. Do you think it made you a better investor having that peace of mind? hundred percent. Hmm. So yeah. well, then maybe you're making the case that by raising the, 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 the bottom, you're also raising the ceiling because you, you're sort of getting a piece of personal mind basically. Yeah. Yeah. It just lets you get through the volatility easier knowing that you own what you own. You know, it's like whether, you know, when you have a mortgage in your house, you don't own it, you know, the bank owns it and that's hmm. kind of how I viewed it. Right. Does your wife work and did, did she work at the time as well? She did for the first couple of years and then, and then she, then she stopped. Um, so there was, you know, a period of eight years where, you know, it was basically, I was supporting our, you know, basically our, our lifestyle, you know, so, mm -hmm. and it's a, it's a, as a full-time private investor, I mean that I can't speak higher about the emotional toll that takes on a person, um, just just that aspect of when your sole source of income is capital gains right you know um because i didn't i didn't have any money coming in from microcapclub.com where later i would a little bit but it was just strictly capital gains was supporting us you know and so you know and again it's like i'm not a trader i'm a buy and buy and um not forget but just try to buy and hold investments that i believe in and keep track of them but you know, again, it's like I can have a year where I was down 30% and next year I'm down 20. And that's kind of how I viewed it too. When I, my goal when I was in my early twenties was to become a full-time private investor. And then six or seven years later, I was able to do it during GFC in 2008, 2009. And one of my decision points for how much money I would need to make that decision was 
what amount of the portfolio would I need to be able to sustain two 30% drawdowns in the portfolio in back-to-back -back years and not change who I am, not change my philosophy, my strategy, uh, not freak out and all of a sudden start chasing things in different areas, you know, trying to make the money back. Uh, and so that kind of gets back to my, what I was saying too about just worst case scenarios. Like I'm always thinking conservatively when it comes to that to allow me to be aggressive over here, which is kind of what you were talking about with the barbell. Yeah. Yeah, more or less. And so Yeah. why I'm asking about your wife there, and that, I mean, this is getting personal, so people might find this boring, but the idea for us is to have kids. And I grew up with a lot of uh, love and attention from my mom. She was there pretty much all the time. My dad was an entrepreneur growing up, so I got to grow up around my parents, and that's sort of what I want for my kids as well. Right. But that would mean that my wife wouldn't have to work full time. Now, we are lucky here where she works full time with me on this business. We also still have the cafe, potentially not for longer. Different story. But the point is, I want to be at a point where uh, my wife can go work if she wants to, but she doesn't have to uh, because, you know, for example, we want to have kids and we want those kids to get a bunch of attention from her and from me. So, That's also influencing that decision, right? Because not having a mortgage above your head means that, um, you know, potentially one paycheck can support uh, Yep. the three or four of us or how many ever 17 kids we might decide to have. So uh, hopefully not 17. But that's sort of, that that makes it even tougher. Uh, and I didn't Kids expect are that kids in are years. expensive, I'll tell you that. So <laughs> you have, <laughs> what do you have, two? yeah, I have two kids. Nice. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Yeah. They're great though. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then at the same time, I also have friends who would call me a, a female dog, if you will, uh, for not wanting to hold on for longer, maybe even put in more money here. Um, and that also makes, I mean, that also plays a, a trick on your psyche. I mean, as much as you, you say, don't be influenced by people around you, you are, um, or at least I am. So, Yeah. so, so Yeah. let's, let's, uh, let's maybe talk about this, uh, the act of patience here more because you've divided it nicely into subgroups, which makes it easier for my monkey brain to understand. And, but so you say that it's, it's something you basically learn over time, this act of patience, like a skill that you develop in different stages is sort of like maybe combat sports where you get punched in the face a lot before you actually start learning a lot of stuff. And with the first one, uh, the first one that you mentioned here is developing your, your temperament, which you say that it means understanding who you are when it comes down to risk, time horizons, volatility, position sizing, something we're going to talk about later on, hopefully, and uh, value as well. Those are five things that on the surface are, appear maybe pretty self-explanatory, stuff that you can literally Google or, or go on YouTube and learn more about. But then you say that they're, they aren't as obvious and that there's no one-size-fits-all approach. That's why I was sort of getting into the personal stuff here. So how do, I mean, how, how have you approached these five things? Well, it, and it's interesting. One of the hardest things is when somebody asks me, you know, about micro cap investing, you know, what, how do, how do I find, you know, winning stocks or something like that? And it's, and it's, and it's kind of like, well, what type of investor are you? Like, what are you looking for? You know, it's like somebody telling you that they're an, a real estate investor. It's like, well, you know, what type of real estate investor are you? You know, because you, you have the same, I tell you, like down in micro cap, you have the same flavors of investing as you have up in large cap. They're just smaller, you know, whether that's growth or value or resources or this or that, you know, the same flavors of investing are down here, you know, but a big part of it is just over time, kind of putting in the reps, you know, having some wins, having some losses and figure out emotionally where you need to be when it comes to position sizing, time horizon, you know, volatility, those things that you mentioned from the article. And it just takes time to figure out where you need to be to be able to take advantage of Mr. Market in the marketplace, you know, emotionally and try to take the other side of a trade or have a contrarian viewpoint or a variant viewpoint on a business or industry or commodity. Um, it just takes time to figure that out. It's like I, as a resource investor, I kind of compare it to the, and I'm sure most of your audience, you know, has heard of the, the Lasan curve. You know, it's like you, you look at that curve and it's like exploration, discovery, you know, permitting, mining, whatever it is. And you have like this big, huge gap up in the beginning and then it falls down. And I, I used to always call that first bubble of the Lasan curve, the oh shit curve, excuse my language, because it was just like uh, the mining company was like, oh shit, we found something. And then stock would go up and then 
three months later, oh shit, we found something. Like when you realize this management team doesn't have the skill or financing to actually push the project further. <laughs> That's <laughs> when it draws back down, right? Um, and so I think as a resource investor too, it's like you you probably need to look at that that type of curve and figure out, you know, if you're going to be in resources, like what type of that, what part of that curve do you want to invest in? Is it all parts of that curve? Is it just the front part? Is it just the back part? Is it in the middle part? Is it certain percentages towards each one? You know, and how much, um, you know, over time, over the first 10 years, you figure out, well, is a 5% position size, you know, too much for my emotions to take if it goes to 10 or 15% of the portfolio? You know, it, wh where do you need to be? Um, and I think the good thing about all of this is, when you look at all the goats of investing from Peter Lynch to Buffett to, you know, a bunch of, you know, obviously resource investors too, they all invest differently. Um, they all invest with different position sizing. They all invest in different parts of the cycle. Uh, you can make your money anywhere, any way you can, as long as it's done, I think, in a thoughtful way that you've thought through. Um, you know, so I think you can do it any way you want, you know, as long as you really think through it and you put in those reps, but it just takes, it takes five or 10 years to figure out where you, what flavor of investing you want to invest in. And that's kind of what temperament is. Okay. It takes five to 10 years though. Yeah, it takes, I think it takes, I mean, I'm still like, I've been doing this for 23 years and I'm, I, I think I'm in three. I think I finally got to number three in that list committing to your principles. Um, and in that article, I mentioned examples of two or three really great investors that, you know, they didn't really hone down in on exactly the type of investor they were for 20, 30 years. Uh, you know, and whether it's, um, I believe one of Reese, what Duca, who focuses on vertical software companies, it took him 30 years to get to that point. He has one of the best track records on the planet, you know, uh, Zakaria and Sleep at Nomad's Fund, same thing. Like it took them 15 years to, to really realize they want to focus on this business model called scale economic shared, you know, the Amazons, the Costco's, those types of things, and really just put all their money in four stocks, which was like those four, and then just crush it. You know, it took them like 15 years to figure out that's what they want to focus on. Hmm. And for a lot of us, you know, it takes a long time to, to figure out, you know, what exactly the type of investor we are, and then sticking to those principles, not getting too far outside of our competence and sticking to it and waiting for those situations that come up once a year or once every three years to swing the bat. Hmm. Could, could it happen faster though? Because I'm, I, yes, I am one of those people. Like, I feel like it happened faster to me because I, I feel like I know what I want to focus on. It, it's easier though, because my business obviously either being online is, is focused around that too, but it's exploration development. And specifically, not even development, like the Lausanne curve, I want to be I want to be out by the time it goes into a PE, unless mm -hmm. it's sort of a l stacking of the Lausanne curve and stuff like that, that rarely yep. happen, but everybody thinks they're always going to happen. So could it could it have could it have happened faster to me like in, in three years? Well, and I'm not saying you're not making money along the way. Mm. You know, it's like I, 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 I figure I'm like right at three now and I've made decent money in one and two. It's not like you're losing money of this whole journey. It's like you you might be making money the whole time and making good money at it. It's just that it takes a long time to figure out exactly where you fit. Um, and you're and you're continuously evolving just as I am. Like the way I invested 15 years ago isn't anywhere near where I am today. Um, mm -hmm. um, so I should have said that differently. It's not, not to say that you're going to be losing money for 15 years. You could be making a lot of money during those 15 years. It's just that you finally feel like you hit your sweet spot and figure out where you where you belong you know, 10 or 15 years into it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Fair point. So this is not, um, it's not a cheat sheet for how to stop losing money. It's more a cheat sheet as to how do you, how do you become a, a great investor, if you will. Yeah. Position sizing, obviously a part of that, but it's one of those five things that you mentioned there. Um, does that change in the process? Because give you an example with this rough numbers, I don't track this. I'm not overly fuss over net worth and, and I don't, I don't typically track these things closely, but very roughly, I started, there's another famous investor, Rick Rule, basically, who more or less made me do a barbell approach. Like he was he was on my head saying, like, you have to do something different here. You cannot be 100% into juniors because it's your wife and your money. And so I did the barbell approach. And, and so I split the portfolio more or less in half. Half of it is our, um, uh, is, is, is capital within our 
uh, within our primary residence. And then the other half is within the junior space. And one half of one half, so I guess in total roughly, again, 25% of the net worth was that one position off the bat. Arguably a very aggressive bet right there, right? So because that's half of my liquid portfolio. So does position sizing change for you? And is is that how you have approached it? Talk to me about that. Well, it. I wish I could say there was one size fits all. You know, you, you and you and I probably aligned closer to how we got started. You know, because I was, I've always, from when I was twenty up to when I was a full time private investor. So when I was twenty seven, twenty eight, you know, I was mainly in three or four stocks. You mm. know, and I would know those stocks better than anybody else, and that was kind of my my edge was you know I would just know those situations really well. And it wasn't the same three or four stocks. I mean, it would, I'm just saying at any given time. Um, and as the cap, as my capital grew, you know, it might've went to four to five and five to six and six to seven. And today I manage a fund and we have eight, you know, so we're very concentrated still. And it's mm -hmm. only because I feel I put in enough reps being concentrated, letting things grow up to 50% of the portfolio or more, um, winning big that way, losing some in that way as well when you're wrong. Like I feel comfortable with large position sizing. And I always have to watch myself because I don't want that to seem like bravado. Like that's the best way to do it. You know, because there's plenty of people that have a hundred stocks in their portfolio that still outperform the market. And that might be better for the way they invest. Um, you know, for the way I invest, I've always been comfortable taking larger concentrated positions and then just really knowing those positions really well, kind of forming that independent conviction, you know, into them. So I can hopefully do the right thing at the right time when the market's doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. Mm. That's why at the beginning, I sort of said that this discussion might not be applicable to very many people. And it was sort of from a selfish perspective, because again, I get to do this full time as well. Like I interview yeah. these companies for a living, literally. Well, most people, if you're, you know, if you're a construction worker and dentist, whatever it might be, you have a full time gig that might even require more than you full time, 40, 50 hours a week, whatever. How many hours do you really have left to look at these positions? And that's why I suppose ETF, ETFs have become so, so popular, something that hasn't really ever attracted me. But um, yeah, there's no, there's no one size fits all as far as I understand it. So yeah. What are, how do you, that, that's a concentrated portfolio that you talked about. You have eight stocks. I'm happy you said that. Um, because I, I, I can looking sort of trying to, you know, pulling up my crystal globe and looking into my future, I cannot see myself owning more than that, like eight, 10 stocks at most. And that would already be like almost too much. What are, what are some, some practical ways, if you will, of, of managing your emotions here though? Like the, something, something you do when you're up or down a lot on a stock, what do you do? I, for me, and it might be different than the typical resource investor is I'm always trying to disconnect the stock price from the business and trying to keep my pulse on that business and trying to always just be in winning situations and businesses that are executing. And this is where it does relate to resources and management teams that are executing. Hmm. And a lot of times the market gets prices wrong. And that could be when they go up too far too fast, you can take some off. And they get it wrong when things come back down in too far, too fast. Um, and when I think about stock picking, there I, I always think that there's the kind of five core skills to picking stocks, regardless of whether you're in resources or wherever you invest. And it's number one, I think the first skill is identifying actionable ideas before others. Number two, just buying, you know, and I would kind of put that part and parcel to valuation you know, buying at the right price with limited downside, which we talked about earlier. Number three, kind of just position sizing, because there's been tons of white papers that that do show like your position sizing makes up more than 50% of your future returns, more so than the actual idea itself. It's just how you position size yourself into these situations initially. And whether you're averaging up, averaging down, which we can get into that too. Um, holding is a big one. I think that's a skill because that's going to be 98% of what you do is holding. And it's the hardest one to do because you're not doing anything. And we all love to believe that action equals productivity equals gains. And that's just not how it is. A lot of times you make the biggest gains by sitting there and doing nothing. And then set, then finally selling, you know, selling is, you know, kind of realizing what you've gained or lost if it was a loss. So I think there's kind of like five 
kind of core skills to stock picking. And I think when you look at all the really good stock pickers, they do all five of those skill sets really well. They're above average. And I think the ones that are the best in the world do at least one of those five, the best in the world, you know, whether that's identifying, whether that's buying position sizing, whatever, you know, I think you have to be good above average at all five of those skills. And I think to be the best top 1% in the world, you have to be the best at least one of those skills. Hmm. And I know that's a mouthful. We could probably do a whole podcast on that. But exactly, that's um... actually that's actually <laughs> well said because on, on those five yeah. things, you can, um, I, I guess you can only you can make a full podcast on the selling part alone. Um, yeah, because it's often you know we can say, you know, oftentimes it's it's oversimplified. I find so I've I've tried talking, uh, uh, mentioning this a couple of times at different you know chat groups and whatever. Most people would say, oh, you're just overthinking this. Just sell it in tranches. Sell a little bit right now. Then sell a little bit later on, hold on to a little bit, do a free ride where you sell to take out your initial position. Someone said do a double free ride where you take out your initial position multiplied by two so that you you pay back yourself and then you have that money to redeploy it in a different opportunity. And so you have two free stocks is how they describe it, which is not exactly yeah. the case. But I mean, it sounds too simple, but I, it, it sounds simple, but it doesn't feel simple to do selling. I find... I find selling when you're selling winners, it's kind of 50% um, I gauge on where the business is today versus I'm always, I'm thinking about selling. It's like, where is that valuation today versus where I think it's going to be in three years? You know, and if I think there is, if I think this business can double from where it is today in three years, you know, I'm going to hold it. It doesn't matter if it just went up 400% in the last year or not. You know, it's always based on three year look forward of where I think it could be. And it gets a little bit more difficult in resources because you always have to, you know, really factor in some dilution into that, you know, where exactly it will be. But that's predominantly. And then the other one is kind of strictly, um, some people might not like to hear this, but it, it's strictly kind of emotional or psychological too. Uh, I remember I was on the honeymoon with my wife. This would have been 2010. And when we were on the honeymoon, one of the, st my biggest position went up like 100% that week. And I, it was like a seven figure type gain. Wow. And I remember I was with her and she was just like, she made the comment as we were talking and she's like, you're really a dick. You're an asshole. You know, I, I made a comment and, and, it, and like, I let it sink in and I was just like, I was like, yeah, I am getting cocky. You know, I'm just like, I immediately sold like 30% of my position. I was just <laughs> like, you could, <laughs> and that's why I said it. it's probably a bad example, but you know, you can, you can kind of feel it in your emotions and you're getting overconfident. And some of these things too. Um, and I found like that is, is a factor. And a lot of people don't like, wouldn't like me saying that because it's not something you can quantitatively pinpoint, but it's something I've, I've realized in my own psychology, you know, it does play a role into when I sell is, you know, how overconfident or cocky am I? I just need to talk to my wife, I guess. Right. She's my sell signal, but, <laughs> but, uh, but no, I think it's, I think it's a combination. I try to make it mainly be about where the business is going to be in three years, whether the stock went down or whether the stock went up, you know, always looking forward, trying to be in the moment, in the present. If I was buying the stock for the first time, this business for the first time today, regardless if I've owned it for 10 years or two months, you know, would I still own it and would I buy it here? Mm. Um, some of my biggest mistakes, and I wrote an article about this, has been averaging down into things. And... Averaging down is always easy because whatever you're averaging down in always looks cheap, you know? So it's just easy to keep on buying more and more. And all of a sudden this 5% or 10% position that you had, all of a sudden you have 30% of capital deployed into this thing that keeps going down and you're kind of like, oh man, you know? Um, and so that's where a bulk of my mistakes over the years have been. And, you know, it gets back to whenever I'm averaging down, it, it can only be in a business that is consistently executing where the business is accelerating, where there's no financing risk. That's the only time I'm averaging down, mm. you know, and averaging down can be the biggest curse that investor does, but it can be also be the biggest asset, you know, because the market does give you opportunities, whether it's a resource or a commodity that goes out of, goes out of cycle for, you know, six years or whether it's, 
a business that's just kind of the fundamentals are backfilling, even though the business is doing very well, that gives you an opportunity to buy more at a lower price. Uh, there's there's definitely opportunities there, but I have some strict rules now about averaging down that I you know should have as a poster up on my wall because I still break some of the rules. And every time I break one of the rules, I lose money. So, hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, that sounds like another blog post right there. Um, so, but but it's selling in tranches, though. It, it seems like it, like you never sell out of a full position in one go. Um, I shouldn't say never. I I definitely have before, you know, and especially in circumstances that where they run up too far too fast. Kind of gets back to those times where you know something ten x's in a year, and you know it's gone up too far too fast. It's being priced for perfection. And you know when the first piece of imperfect news comes out, the thing's going to get cut in half. And I've been part of those so many times on the losing end and also finally on the winning end is just, all right, I need to take some off the table. Mm -hmm. You know, I need to sell the position entirely because I know I'll probably be able to buy this back 50% cheaper at some point in time in the future. Right. Um, so it's not always for me, you know, taking a little bit off. For me, because I'm concentrated and I'm a very qualitative focused investor, like I have very good relationships with all the CEOs and management teams of every company I invest in, you know, it's it's very much conviction for me as like a relationship, you know. And so, you know, a lot of times, you know, you're selling because quite honestly, the business isn't doing well all of a sudden, you know, you were just wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I found is for me, a lot of times it is me taking a full position off and being very rational about it and logical about it, not letting the emotions of the fact that, you know, I have relationships, I know the people, I know the management teams, you know, and it, that's why I've been able to do this for so long. It's not really any huge wins I've had, which I've had a few of them. It's really just the losses I never had to take over hmm. time, being able to cut the cord and move on. Um, cause this is, it's, it's a tough business, what we do, especially in resources, you know, and especially even what I do looking at profitable growing businesses, like a lot of these things will have a one or two year kind of winning span where they just crush it for two quarters to eight quarters. You know, it's because that one product or service they sold just takes off for some random reason, you know, and, um, and it's a life cycle to it. You know, I'm trying to find ones that hopefully can keep doing that for 10 years, but they're hard to find. Um, and so the average holding period for my portfolio, I would love to say it's forever, but it's probably one to two years, you know, and, and I'm trying to find those ones that are worthy of being able to hold them for five, 10, 15 years. And I do hold some things in the portfolio that I've held for five, seven, eight years. Um, but there's a lot of turnover under the surface to try to find those things that are worthy of holding long-term. Mm. Well, with resources, I actually... I would actually maybe argue that it's easier because they now that I'm thinking about it, maybe they, they go up really for three reasons. One of those is just market conditions. Silver goes to six hundred bucks as all YouTube videos tell me it finally does it. You know, silver stocks might go up even if they only have yeah. silver in the name. Not might, they will. Um so market conditions basically are one of them. The other one is a promote, you know, they they're doing something very aggressively promotion wise that they're promoting to an audience that doesn't understand it and they're just aping into the stock with no reason. Dangerous situation, obviously, as you've mentioned. And then the third reason is the rocks, basically. But those are three things that are much easier to track, for example, than for like because you, you look at revenue generating businesses, companies that are about to make, you know, positive free cash flow. But if they're selling, I don't know, some weird pen, you don't know the exact reason why the pen would sell or would not sell. So I don't know if that makes any sense. No, I mean, that's the... The thing that anti-resource investors, you kind of kind of invert it. Um, you know, on the resource side, you don't have to have a sales and marketing department. You don't have to try to sell the product. There's a market for your whatever you're selling at any day, and you know what that price is. You know, and that's kind of that's kind of the the inversion of how people like to downplay resources is yeah, but we, you know, there's always a market for it. Um, and that's the cool thing about resources too. You don't have to worry about that. You just have to get it out of the ground. Uh, if that's the part of the curve you want to play on the Lasan curve, you know, maybe it's just the discovery part of it. Um, yeah. yeah. I don't remember the first part of your question or else I would answer it, but <laughs> there was no question. That's, that's okay. most of my questions are non questions. Actually. I just, I just, 
trying to skid through life in an easy way, just make the guest speak. But <laughs> what is something else that I've been thinking about is that that like you buy based on market cap and you sell based on share price. Does that make sense? Because of dilution. So when I when I when I look at something and I think is this cheap, but I, and I haven't bought it, I look at the market cap. But then when I when it comes on to selling, I don't necessarily look at the market cap. I look at the share price because that's what influences my portfolio. And so you have a bias to yourself first, as opposed to having a bias to the business. That's sort of a flaw that I've noticed in myself. I don't know if I'm making any sense, but <laughs> <that's> <laughs> no, I, I know what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Is that well? How do you approach that when it comes on to buying? Uh, you look at the market cap, and then when it comes on to selling, you look at the share price, or do you always look at only the market cap? I'm I'm mainly looking at the the total enterprise value of the business. Okay. So I'm I'm looking at that, which includes debt, hmm. and and just seeing where I believe that business can be in three years, and trying to stick to that time frame. Uh, because what I what I found, and I think it's for any market cap class, but especially in micro cap. You know, it's like everyone's so short term minded. And what I mean is like six months or less. We all say that we're long term, but they're not. They're more mainly short term. And if you can just take a one to three year variant view on a situation or business or commodity or whatever, and um, find situations where there's you're buying at a price where it's hard to lose money. I mean, I think that's an investment philosophy that works in the long term. And that's what I'm predominantly trying to do with my with my portfolio as well. And so when it comes to selling, though, it's always based on what's the valuation of this business. Um, is management, is the management team doing what they said they were going to do? And what I found is the ones that are winning in the portfolio, you know, those are, those are companies where management's probably exceeding expectations and they're, they're rare. It's rare to find them in resources. It's rare to find them anywhere. And the ironic thing is we're always most prone to sell the ones that are actually winning, that are actually executing. We work so hard to find them and then we look for any reason to sell them. You know, mm -hmm. when they start moving up, right? <laughs> yeah. Instead of like trying to find the reasons to sell the losers that are a portfolio, the ones that we keep on justifying averaging down into, you know, because they're so cheap and they can't get cheaper and then you go down another 30%. Um, instead, we're looking for every reason to sell the things that are winning in the portfolio. And that's mm -hmm. kind of the irony of the psychology of investing as well, as we let the short-term stock price dictate our conviction. Right. And this is basically, we've gone through, what have we gone through? So time horizons, we talked about, you said it often to one to two years for you, position sizing, you said fairly concentrating, um, value determinant, what you just told me, enterprise value, volatility is the part where we talked about how you deal with emotions. Risk is sort of the the only one left here in the in the spectrum. And and again, another very personal thing, but you know sometimes I hear you want a one to three um, risk reward ratio where like this could you know, it could go up three times, but you can only use it, lose your money once or something among those lines. How do you deal with risk? Do you have any fixed rules around it? Risk for, risk for me mainly revolves around the dilution part, okay. you know, because that's usually my main risk as a micro cap investor is the company's inability to raise capital if it's an unprofitable company. Or if they do, it's on such unfavorable terms where it's a 30% down round with a whole warrant and then another warrant. And you're like, wait a minute, it's going to take, you know, 15 years to actually make money back. And, you know, and so unfortunately, that's just what you deal with as a micro cap investor. And so I'm, I'm the risk side of it is mainly focused on can this management team execute their plan without raising capital? Hmm. Not the case in, in exploration. So it's very hard. Yeah. Yeah, it's very hard. It's just pretty much impossible. Um, they have to raise capital eventually. Well, actually, but I but I will say I think in resources, just like in healthcare or anything else that's sort of pre-revenue. I mean, it is a. I would put a lot of emphasis, and it's one thing I put a lot of emphasis on too: is the people. You know, hmm. is the people themselves? Do they have a track record? Have they? Um, discovered something else? Have they put something into production? Have they, do they, you know, what's their track record look like? And that's one thing you can look up as a resource investor is, you know, their previous track record and success. You know, you want to, it's a, even though you're a resource investor and, you know, want to find the next, you know, whatever 5% uh, copper deposit, you know, it's like, it's, it's still worth next to nothing without the right people in charge. Mm. Um, and you can bet on it getting taken out because it's so cheap, but that's not fun. So just try to bet on winners. You want to bet on jockeys, the right jockey. People have done it before. 
that have found discoveries or have permitted them or financed them that have a track record because they're going to have a lot of people that want to help them along the way too. So it's a big part of mine is just trying to find those great leaders amongst these companies as well. Mm. Uh, and the good thing is you know, it's easy to see their track record for most parts. And, you know, unless they're brand new as a CEO, uh, but even then you can kind of do some background and interview mm. some people and see if they've always done what they said they were going to do, or if they screwed people along the way, you know, you can find out what their character is. Yeah. So. That's something that I do try and, and do again, kind of being lucky that I get to do it for a living. Th th there's something that I wanted to ask. And initially, when I thought about this, when I sent that first email a couple of weeks ago, was thinking, I wanted to ask about FOMO, fear of missing out, right? And I started thinking about it, that it's not really FOMO in this case. What it is, is FOROMO, like F-O-R-O-M-O. -O -O. It's like fear of regret of missing out. So I don't want to regret having missed out on a deal. Is that something you, well, you've probably had to deal with this where you, I mean, you sold too early and then you had to deal with Romo, regret of missing out. And did you then develop a fear of having that feeling again? This getting very meta, but but I think you know what I'm saying. I don't, you know, it's I actually wrote an article about this recently. I'm trying to remember what the title was. I think it was called like, you have more time than you think or something like that. It's on our blog. Um, but it's funny. It's like a lot of, and I'm going to back into your, to the answer to your question or your comment, but as resource investors or micro cap investors, there's so much emphasis made towards discovery. Like I want to find this idea before somebody else. And the reason it's that way is because these are illiquid companies in many regards, many of them. Um, and so somebody just buying $50,000 worth of stock can all of a sudden move the stock up or down or whatever. And so there's a lot of emphasis on discovery and being first to an idea. But the reality is, you know, a lot of the companies that I'm in, even my current portfolio, I mean, almost every year the market gives you an opportunity to buy the things that you like at a very good risk adjusted price. You know, just look at the volatility in some of the names that you like on a yearly basis. Um, and it's one of the things I was just like dwelling on. And I wrote the article about it is, you know, again, just because a stock moves up doesn't mean that it's not a buy. You know, just, you know, there's plenty of times where a company, a stock can go up two, three, 500%, and it might be a better buy than it was when it was lower because it was de-risked. Um, maybe the company has more revenues or more earnings or more customers. It's a better quality situation. It deserves a higher multiple or whatever, you know, but then over time, just the market just gives you opportunities where the great thing about resources or micro cap stocks is, you know, there's probably at least one or two days out of the year where all of a sudden the stock's down 30% for no reason in the first 10 minutes of trading. And then somebody just decides to wake up and sell this illiquid stock um, out of their entire position. And it's not really anything company centered. It's because they wanted to, you know, raise 50 grand to pay for their daughter's wedding or go on a vacation or whatever it is. And everyone around the stocks, like look at each other, like somebody knows something, this company's going to do a financing or whatever it is. And really nothing's going on. Um, and those are the opportunities where if you know that company, well, you can, you know, add along the way. Right. And so it's almost like every year, you know, very few times I can think of over the last 23 years of my career, would I have not had a, a second bite or third bite at that apple if I would have just waited a little bit? Hmm. Very, very few times you look back and be like, well, I really missed that one. You know, so Did that's you, the that... way I would reframe that a little bit is like even, even stocks I bought at like, you know, $15 a share last year, and they might be at $23 per share this year, but it's fundamentally probably at a cheaper price, better risk adjusted price. They're executing. Like it's just as good of a buy here than it was lower. So, that's something that I'm definitely yet to learn or wrap my head around. Like when I see a stock that's gone up 50%, maybe it went from from being nothing to being like a 0 0.5, but it's trading at the valuation of it being a 0 0.01. But it's still going from 0 to 0 0.01 is, 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 is an infinite percentage. And it looks yeah. like, okay, it went up a lot. I'm too late. But it can still go to 1 from there or something along those lines. So the, the article that you mentioned, I, I sort of I pulled it up here. It's called You Have Time. Um, being first to something isn't as important as being right. And then you t it's interesting you talk about relationships here. And you say that relationships and stock selection have a bunch of similarity similarities. And, and, and that's funny when you say for some it only takes 
one date to realize this person isn't the one for others. It can take six to 12 or 24 months to decide yes or no. The funny thing is I met my wife in May and we moved in in September and that was uh, May nine years ago. So oh, wow. yeah, it was very quick for me to sort of decide and stick to it. And I think there's a psych, psych, something psychological behind that that I could maybe trace back to my portfolio too. Uh, but I mean, yeah, how do you reconcile those things? Well, and I think one of the things I mentioned in that article was there, there was an investment that we made in our fund where we started the due diligence process last March, so a year ago. And we didn't really make an investment till December of last year, so about nine months later. And we got to know the management team. We flew out to meet them. We gave them some advice. They took it. And it was kind of a more natural flow of a relationship where, you know, you got to really see who that person is over time, you know, just like you did with your your wife, maybe pretty quickly in the beginning. But, you know, it just takes time to see to find out who somebody really is, see them at their highs, see them at their lows, you know, to see how they react to things, see how they treat you, see how they treat others, you know, when they're not feeling well, mm -hmm. you know, to you know, to, to form that connection. I feel it's the same way with investments too. Like just the ability to, for me, I'm high touch, but like seeing how this management team acts, you know, over time, you mm -hmm. know, and, and it worked out well in that scenario because the stock didn't move and we made an investment into them uh, directly. And, uh, you know, it felt like a more natural way to do it because we actually gave it time for that relationship to, to blossom. And quite honestly, and you probably understand this too, most situations that you invest in as a small or micro cap investor, you will probably like them less than six months for whatever reason, especially if you're a high touch relationship driven, you're talking to management or whatever. It might not be quite as bad in resources because a lot of it's depending on resource, the resource itself and how advancement's going. But um, if you're investing in businesses, a lot of times, like it, what I found is probably eight out of 10 companies, you're going to like it less than six months if you just wait six months. Um, because you'll have a chance to kind of see who those people really are, you know, um, did they, did they overpromise, under deliver that type of thing? Um, and so in that circumstance, which I mentioned in that article, you know, it took nine months and it was one of the few ones, the one of the rare ones, uh, that you actually liked more, the longer you own them, which those are the, those are the special ones, the ones you genuinely like more, the longer you own them. I feel like in resources, it's also... What you have is is oftentimes sort of a cult following to a company. I don't know how much that is in in other in other place, but a, a you know just a cult following where over time the the you know management keeps under delivering, not doing what they said at all. But there's a a very certain group of people who who just keep supporting the company and and they're allowed on social media and it looks like everything's going great, but it's not. The stock price is falling. They're pivoting into a different project. They're not able to get the same recoveries, whatever it might be. And so that's something I've tried to stay away from. Um, if I if I notice a cult following, well, not necessarily stay away from it, but sort of be cognizant of it and try to bring it into account, if that makes sense, when I'm when I'm making my own decisions. No, I I love. Well, you're, you're you're turned into how I am. Like I love it when you when you search Twitter or X or wherever, and there's no activity. Yeah. There's no no one talking about it. There's no cult type behavior in it. Yeah, that's what I, I I love that part of it. Like when you feel like, all right, this is a brand new almost idea. Hmm. Um, if, if there's going to be a cult following, like I'm okay entering if it's actually, if, if, if the, the situation isn't doing well, because a lot of times that signifies a potential turnaround opportunity, um, you know, where people can only remember it for its past. You know, maybe yeah. a new management team took over the project. Uh, but you know, 90% of the people are still in it from that. Remember the previous management team that mismanaged or misdiluted or whatever, you know, and that's all they mm -hmm. remember. And there's usually an opportunity there. If it's a real management team to get involved while it's still just underfollowed. Um, and that's, that's, that's the benefit of looking at some turnarounds, you know, those pinpointing those really good, probably resources or, um, situations and resources where a new management team is taking over an old project, but has a good pedigree. Mm. Have you done turnarounds yourself where you've nudged management or make sure that, I mean, they get a, some, you know, new people in the door and get, throw someone else out or some, something like an activist investment? I'm not an activist, so no, like I'm, but we do have 
one of our big things that we do is try to pinpoint and kind of have our spidey sense and feelers out for those management transitions, you know, so large kind of insider purchases, you know, that could signify a new management team coming in, putting skin in the game. Hmm. And that's what kind of pinpoints us to look deeper and dive deeper into an idea. And it's usually at that, that circumstance is usually at the low in the stock. And what you want to see is from those management teams that go through the bios and you see like, oh, these people have been here and done this before. Like, oh, they've they've taken a project from, you know, a moose pasture into something in production three times before. This is the bringing the team back together again. You know, it's like that type of feeling. And those yeah. are the special ones. That's when you get on the phone really quick or get on a plane really quick um, mm -hmm. and see what's going on. Because sometimes in those circumstances, because they already have success personally, they don't need anybody else's money. They're not as quick to pick up the phone or respond to an email when you reach out to them because they don't need your money. Um, they have their own and you know, you have to make the extra effort to get their attention. Uh, and there's, that's also a good quality, quality attribute that I've found in, in the good management teams is, you know, when I send an email to their IR person, it doesn't take them 3.2 seconds to get back to me. It might take three days, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> it means they're actually doing business. So it's like, <laughs> that's yeah. what you want to see. That's what you want to see. You do want them to get back to you, though, and not ignore it. Yeah. It sucks when they ignore you. Happens to me every day, literally every day. But um, what is your, what was your, I think I might have asked you that before, but what was your sort of your first big win? And how did you, I mean, th this is my first big win. How how did you handle yours? Um, So it's hard because I, I had a couple big wins. One was during the dot-com bubble, but I it's, it's hard to pinpoint too much. Just got lucky kind of investing in technology stocks. Uh, and that was when I was a teenager. And then the second big win I had was XM satellite radio, but that was mainly luck. And that one I sold out of. So it's hard to like draw too many lessons from that. Um, I had a whole bunch of small wins in the early 2000s that were mainly in, in story stocks. And I had a couple of mentors that kind of mentored me along the way in the early 2000s that I met on public stock message boards. And they kind of showed me the, the qualitative art of getting to know management, talking to management, um, forming relationships with management. And that's kind of what how my kind of qualitative approach has blossomed since then was some of those mentors that I had early on kind of showing me that that qualitative art of, you know, it's just like, you know, how to win friends and influence people a little bit and just how to be likable, you know. See if you can extract extract information in, in a positive way, you know, <laughs> you know, just try to get to know them, be friendly, you know. Um, mm. And so along the way, though, I. I think what I've done well is sell at the right time, because 99 percent of them, you're going to end up selling them. You know, it's just the reality of it, yeah. you know, and, and probably a bulk of them or because the business turns or something goes in an unfavorable way. And it doesn't mean you lost money on it. It just means it didn't ultimately end up being the type of huge winner that you thought it could be, you know, it might only, might only have been a double instead of a 10 bagger that you thought, you know, and that's okay. Like we, like we talked about before, you double your money every three years, you're doing pretty good over 20 years. Um, Antonio is buying his island in 20 years if he does that. So. <laughs> not necessarily something I aspire, but it's not, yeah. not not something I would be opposed to either. It'd be fear here, but yeah. Or or three more bakeries, whatever you choose. <laughs> how would, but okay, how how did you, like, when you got lucky, how did you deal with that? Did you realize like, okay, I got lucky. I need to get out ASAP. And then you started offloading shares. So like how, 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 how did that process go? Yeah. Down? I mean, I would just set like, one of the things that it, I, I look for today that I look for then, even though I was predominantly more on the story stock end of things, just stories, you know, less about fundamentals, was trying to find those one or two public companies that hit the sweet spot of a trend. Like if me 15 years ago would have been into AI names like three years ago, like trying to find the yeah. best like micro cap AI play, knowing that the crowd was going to come to it. And eventually push it up reason, you know, for good reasons or fundamental reasons or story stock reasons. That's what I did. Um, I was trying to find these trends and try to find the best micro cap, small public company benefactor of those trends and then ride it as long as I thought that trend was continuing. Um, and, in, and trying to get it at a relatively undervalued price and then 
the goal was to sell it when it got very, very overvalued. You know, I want to find something undervalued that can get overvalued. Mm. Um, and so I, part of what I do today includes an element of that where I'm trying to find these unique businesses where it's a one of one or one of two companies in the public ecosystem that are in a trend. It's just the difference now is I prefer them to be profitable, mm. you know, and so I prefer them to, you know, be profitable, but the goal is still the same. I want to buy them when they're undervalued. But I only want to buy things if I think they have a chance of getting overvalued. You know, I don't want to buy something that I think can get less undervalued over time, not a deep value or even value type investor. Mm. Um, so that's just a little bit of kind of a look into how I've evolved over the years, you know, kind of get back to the point of kind of figuring out who you are, what type of investor you are. Um, you know, I take little, I kind of feel like investing is a little bit like, you're a painter and it takes two or three years and you're only using the color blue and then use the color red and then use the color green, you know, all these things. And then it's only after 20 years, you realize, Oh, look at all these colors I have. I can make my own painting. And so just everything from the past and you're able to, you know, hopefully, hopefully create something beautiful that somebody wants to buy <laughs> later on. <laughs> well, or, or, or you just, um, you know, hope that it's AI in this case, but it's right. <laughs> But you're you're describing sort of a top down versus a bottom up approach, if you will. Yeah. And it kind of went went the same way for me, where it's I started. What drove me here into this space were big stories uh, within the resources. Oh, we we're gonna need more, or the dollar is going to zero, and therefore gold's going to uh, ten thousand or whatever it might be announced. And that attracted me. Then I thought, okay, I'm gonna come up with a framework, and I'm gonna plug names into that framework, regardless of what the business is about. So, ignoring the last part of the of the triangle, whatever you want to call it, and so the pyramid. And so that flipped. Uh, and, and this win that I have now, this paper win, was a completely bottom up approach, like starting sub subsurface, really looking at the rocks first and then going, I don't even care. It's a, it's a gold copper story, but I don't even care about gold copper. In this case, this, this got a read rate because of the land package, not because of where gold or copper are going. So it sounds like you've evolved. I mean, you've evolved from a top down to more of a bottom up approach where you start, you want a profitable yeah. company first. Yeah, exactly. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a combination of both. And I put a lot of emphasis on trying to find the right leaders the right CEO to bet on because mm. that the smaller the company, the the more the moat is the management team because they're also the ones that can destroy it. You know, so I spent a lot of time just getting to know the people. This is also why it's so tricky to to look at an investment and, uh, you know, looking at it from the perspective of risk, time, uh, volatility, position sizing and value. Uh, it's it's tr tricky to look at something and say something like, well, you know, people smarter than I are buying, so I should probably buy too. But then in your case, when Microcap Club, I'm sure people follow you into into positions uh, with the idea of, oh, you know, Ian's smarter than me. He's buying. I should probably buy too. But these things are different for everybody else. So, and then you spoke about mentors earlier. How do you how do you reconcile that whole thing of of following people, but maybe not following them too literally because you're a different person yourself? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you can learn something. I don't believe in following anybody. I don't believe in copying anybody's positions or anything, but I do feel like you can learn something from anybody. Like even my, the first mentor I had was a, was also a full-time gambler. So, you know, he lived first in Florida, then in, then in uh, Las Vegas, he would gamble every day. And, um, the, you know, the way he lived his life, the way, you know, he had like four wives over the course of his, you know, it's not somebody you would want to copy, you know, in that part of his life, but I feel like you, there are, but I learned a lot from him on the investing side and specifically uh, certain areas of it, but there are certain other things I would surely not copy. And that's kind of how I view everybody in conversation. There's, you can learn something from almost anybody. And I actually learned, I learned the most today from, from investors that invest successfully, but not like me, you know, like talking to another person that kind of invests generally like me isn't, I don't learn that much from, them, but I actually learned that, you know, so I actually learned the most by talking to like a deep value investor that invests in a hundred stocks that's short term, mm -hmm. you know, like, you know, that crushes it. Like, well, how does that, like, he's, it's like, you're looking at the polar opposite of yourself, but they're doing really, really well. And that intrigues me. And there's usually something that you can pick up on from how they do things that you can add into your own 
kind of investment strategy or, or framework. And that's usually where I tend to learn the most is from studying people that don't invest like I do. Mm. More than one way to, to skin a cat, I suppose, yeah. uh, unless you're on Reddit or whatever, where people just constantly try to stuff down each other's strategy into each other's throat saying like, oh, no, mine is better. Mine is better. But if in the end, it's about making money and not not being right. That's why that's why you're here. So now in, in your in your portfolio, Antonio, how do you think about adding a new position? Do you always have cash available to buy something new or do you look at it as you need to sell something to buy something new? For now, it just happens that I have cash because I, I have cash coming in. It's sort of a position where, again, also in the process of potentially selling the bakery, which is going to get more cash. So I have free and available cash. But that's not something I did on purpose. It's mostly because I have become very, very, very picky with what I do because I was not very picky before. that. had 25 stocks or something among those lines. Approached it, as I said, top down, lost the money. Then I thought, okay, I have to become very picky. And and again, as I said, there's a total of four positions in my portfolio now. And one of those positions is the one that is doing well now. And it's like maybe not 80. I don't know. It's a lot of like this, most of the portfolio. And so no, it takes a long time for me, uh, but I do do it with free cash uh, that I have. So I wouldn't sell a position to buy another one. I think that's something that I will have to do eventually, but that's going to be very hard. I mean, it sounds very hard to me. Well, it's, it's an added element and everybody, you know, just how they think about cash as a position is is an interesting subject too hmm. because you know I, I talk to a lot of investors that have it seems like they're always holding 30 percent cash and it obviously it's different now with five percent short-term rates and you can get five percent on your cash right now versus a year or two ago when it was one percent or 20 bips on your cash it's a different circumstance but um i've always for me and my way isn't the right way, but for me, I've always had enough cash. That's how I manage the fund too. I always have enough cash to buy half of a new position. Okay. And so it forces me to sell something to buy the other half. So I'm always kind of thinking about, um, is this new position better than what I already own? Mm. You know, from a risk adjusted return. Yeah, you know, there's to use a, American baseball analogy, like, you know, if I have a lineup of 300 hitters, it doesn't benefit me to add a 281, mm. you know, so I, I don't need to dilute my returns by adding, some, just adding something. Um, it needs to be, if I'm adding something, it needs to be significantly better than what I already own. Right. Because I've already built up a trust level with my current positions. I already have, if I own them, they're executing, you know, to replace that. You know, I need something that isn't just a 1% better IRR for the next five years. It needs to be significantly better to replace that trust of what I already own. Hmm. Um, and so that's how I always think about adding a new position is, is it significantly better than what I already own? If it's not, then I'm not going to bother looking at it. Um, I shouldn't say looking at it, but it's, I'm not going to bother adding it. But so you would absolutely even like, because what happened last year when I saw this opportunity, I just put pretty much all of my available cash into it. Um, yeah. bought everything that I could, didn't keep any cash to the site, knowing though, that I was going to have cash coming in. So I didn't, but what, what you're saying here is that you would always keep at least some portion of cash. Like you would never be a hundred percent, uh, invested. Well, I, I would say that I'm usually like 95% invested. Okay. So, you know, I have like enough cash there where I can buy something, but not enough of something. It, it forces me to make the second decision of what do I need to sell? Because mm -hmm. it forces me to then know that I'm going to be selling something to add something else and compare the two or compare the five compared to everything else in the portfolio. Um, so I found that to be, at least for the way I invest, an interesting way to do it is, you know, kind of forcing yourself to compare it to what you already own and making sure that you're not adding mediocre positions just to add something because you're bored or whatever. Um, you're always comparing it to what you already own. But what about in that case, like if, if I... Like if this becomes fully valued tomorrow, I mean, it, 5X is another time tomorrow. And I think, okay, it's fully valued. Let's start scaling out. And I sit on my cash because I just don't find anything that I could, that I, that I, that I want to yep. swing at. And then I stay 20%, 30 or 40% cash for, well, in this case, it's got to be a whole lot more cash, like 80% cash for two years. Does that sound 
reasonable? Because I mean, it seems like yes. it falls I within mean, that. Yeah. If you're a resource investor, I think it's very reasonable. I mean, some of the most successful resource investors sat on cash for 10 years before they pulled the trigger. You know, they're waiting for those troughs in the commodity cycle. And mm -hmm. then they, then they bought up mines or whatever the case may be. So I think that is very, given the way you invest and where you're investing. I mean, I think that is, that should be how it is. You know, you yeah. you're going to have long periods where you do nothing and you're going to be sitting on cash and you're waiting patiently for those opportunities. And it might be something that doesn't mean you have to wait for the commodity cycle to turn bad. It just means you find another opportunity like the one you did where you did the work other people didn't do and make a bet into something that people thought was worth zero. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you're waiting for those. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If you ask my wife, I sit around and do nothing most of the times anyway, so. <laughs> yeah, me um, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well that's another point what n now feels like a bad time in the um, i mean now feels like the time that you should be buying commodities commodity equities um some commodity equities of course but i, I sort of i mean not once in this conversation that we bring up like macroeconomics or specifically interest rates or something else that influences the economy so that it, do you, i mean is, is it a part of your research do you ever include it or how do you look at that I mean, I think about it, but the way I handle kind of that is just trying to find really unique situations, you know, that you're finding at a at a at a great valuation. Um, in my case, the way I invest, I'm looking for businesses that I think can grow through a recession. So it doesn't matter if the unemployment goes from four percent to six percent, or interest rates go from four to six or whatever. I feel like those businesses are going to continue to grow, and whatever they're selling is going to continue to be in demand regardless of the macro backdrop. And that's kind of a qualitative kind of framework on the business that I put on it. Um, so that's kind of, ha I handled the macro by handling the micro in the portfolio. Right. That's that's very well said. That's very well said. I think we can, you know, I, I can, this is maybe not being a great interview because it was mostly me talking, I suppose, but it was a great conversation. Nonetheless, I can keep talking for hours. I don't want to take up your whole day though. And hopefully next time I call you, it's going to be to tell you that I, I made a right choice there. But uh, yeah, I really appreciate your time sitting down with me. What am I uh, What am I forgetting to bring up something that you wanted to talk about, but but we're not? No, I think I think we hit on a lot of good topics and a lot of this stuff you could spend hours and hours talking about, but that's what it makes it so much fun to, to talk about and drill down. And like I said, I, there's very few um, just firm yeses and nos on any of this stuff. It's really just about finding where you fit finding your flavor investing uh, and then just putting a lot of thought into it. Mm. And I think one of the mistakes that resource investors make is they view it like gambling. They look at it as they go up to the roulette wheel and put $500 down the three numbers and walk away. And they're like, Oh, well, you know, but if you want to make money consistently, like handle your business, do the work, you know, mm. and really find unique situations to bet on the right people to bet on. Um, and take it seriously. And I think you're starting to see some, just how you've had one scenario that went up a lot, but that's the type of thing you should be finding that bottoms up thing, you know, that finding that thing that everybody else hasn't found yeah. or looking at it through a different lens. Doesn't mm -hmm. mean you're going to be right, right every time, but um, you know, that's, that's where you make the big money over time. You know, I, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for sitting down with me. It's microcapclub.com. Uh, people can read more of your stuff and uh yeah hopefully we can do this again soon awesome it's a pleasure